Let's start today in Genesis chapter 12. Please open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 12. And we'll start in verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Skip to verse 6. And Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, or Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. To the, now the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now turn to chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22. And we'll start in verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, now take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder. We will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Go to verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing. And have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens. And as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. Father, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for giving us this day to praise you in, to worship you in, to exalt you in. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who have come out today to worship you together. I thank you for all those who will be listening to this. And I pray, Lord, that in spite of myself, you would use me, that your word would go and accomplish its purpose, that it would not return void to you. May your word, Lord, have its perfect work in each of us today. Amen. So Abraham's life is not so foreign to our own lives in that God has chosen us. He has called us. And he has also set us on a, a journey. He's placed us in the midst of an adventure. Amen? 
This calling, this choosing, this election may or may not involve a physical journey, but it most definitely requires a spiritual journey. And we must take that journey as individuals and then also as a community, as a church, as Jesus' body in this place, as First Assembly. We take this journey together also. A spiritual journey, a quest. And the goal of the quest is not perfection. We should know that by now, right? The goal of the quest is not perfection. The goal is holiness. And holiness is not the same as perfection. All of the Lord's festivals, all of the festivals mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23, otherwise known as Torah festivals, all of the Lord's festivals are callings of holiness. The Hebrew phrase for that is Mikra'e Kodesh. Mikra'e Kodesh callings of holiness and specifically Yom Kippur the day of atonement is a call to holiness through repentance we are being called to holiness through repentance as we celebrate this holiday this holy day let's read about God's instruction to Israel and how they were to honor, sanctify the Day of Atonement. Turn to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And we'll skip around a little bit, so follow along with me. And here the Lord begins by instructing Moses how to instruct Aaron, his brother, the high priest. And we'll We'll, we'll pick it up in verse 5. And he, Aaron, shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Verse 15. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull. The blood of the bull, by the way, was to sanctify Aaron as the high priest. And sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the Ark of the Covenant. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sin. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. And with his finger he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it. And from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrate it. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Verse 29. 
And this shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments and the holy garments and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall also make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once a year. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. This is the instruction to the sons of Israel on how they were to sanctify that day, set it apart from other days, and honor and exalt the Lord. Notice in verse 30, though, it says, For on this day atonement shall be made for you. Implication is the high priest shall make atonement for you. Well, Jesus is our high priest, amen, who has made atonement for us. Jesus is also symbolized by the two goats, right? The first goat was for a sin offering, for transgressions, rebellious acts, sin that had been acted upon. This is why Jesus had to die. He died for our transgressions. Amen? His blood became a covering, provided atonement for the things that we have done. The second goat was a scapegoat, or the goat of removal. It was not killed. It was not a blood sacrifice. It was presented before the Lord alive. So what is this? Well, this foreshadows not Jesus' death, but Jesus' resurrection from the dead. The Lord was presented alive to all of the world. And it's the living Jesus who removes our iniquity. Now, how does iniquity differ from transgression? Transgression are the things that we've done. Iniquity is our tendency to do those things again. The Lord has provided a blood covering for the things that we've done and He's provided a way to have victory over the things that we might do if we don't crucify the flesh. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We'll start at the end of the chapter, verse 25. He was delivered up because of our transgressions. And he was raised because of our justification. So here Paul's making a distinction between Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. Both had purpose. Let's continue. Chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Messiah died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. Much more then. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, 
much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So Paul is saying the death of Jesus has justified us. But it's the life of Jesus that saves us. That gives us hope for the future. That gives us power over the flesh. Power over our enemy. No doubt in my mind, Paul is thinking about Yom Kippur here and the two goats. Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. So the Father has made the way for us to be reconciled to Him. He has made the way. Amen? But notice what Paul says there in chapter 5, verse 10. We were reconciled to God. We have a need to be reconciled to the Father. It's not the other way around. God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. We're the sinners. We're the ones who have fallen short of His glory. We have had the need to be reconciled to Him. And it's because it's our need and not His, God has given us the choice to become holy through repentance. He has given us the choice, right? We all have a choice to make. We can believe on Jesus. We can believe that His blood has covered our transgressions. But we must make a choice for our future. And we make that choice through repentance. That's why Paul says, work out, work out your salvation. It's a process. Forgiveness is accomplished. But your salvation is being accomplished. That's why Paul says here, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. We shall be saved by his life. So Yom Kippur calls out to us and says, be holy. Be holy through repentance. Repentance begins with us. It starts by acknowledging to ourselves and to God our failures and our weaknesses. Our failures, our transgressions, those things that we've done, and our weaknesses, our tendencies towards sin, our iniquity. We must acknowledge to ourselves and to God. We have a part to play in this process of redemption. You believe that? You have a part to play in this process of redemption. It's not a magical act. God just doesn't wave a wand over you and you're automatically holy. Now when he sees the blood of Jesus, he sees holiness. But remember that when you stand before the Lord on judgment day, the deeds of your life will be evaluated. Yes, we plead the, the blood of Jesus. But he's looking for a righteous people on the earth today. Righteousness. Not our righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness. Jesus' will being worked through us. Being worked through his body. And he will not do that unless we are holy. Unless we've made that choice to repent. We have a part to play. And the scriptures bear witness to that. Zechariah chapter 1. There is God's part and then there's our part. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 3. The Lord is speaking to his people through Zechariah and says, Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you says the Lord of hosts. Return to me so that I will return to you. We have to make that first step of return. It is likewise said in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, we'll start in verse 7. Again, the Lord is bringing reproof here to the people of Israel through the prophet Malachi. 
saying in verse 7, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your wine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord says, return to me, and then I will return to you, and you will be blessed. Book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Well, where did James get that idea? How about Zechariah and Malachi? Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. No doubt James is including himself in that exhortation. We must cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. So there's God's part and our part. And in some cases, he's waiting for us to take that step. To do our part, and then he will return to us. Abraham had a part to play in the adventure he had with the Lord. Abraham had choices to make along the way. I want to share with you some of this article written by David Nekrutman, a Jewish man. He's the executive director of the Or Torah Stone Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Ephrat, in Israel. And I so much appreciate the Jewish perspective. And I want to share that with you today because he speaks right into this. He says, in most English renditions of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the translation of the verse is, The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. However, these translations leave out a key word from the Hebrew, lecha, meaning for you. The translation should be, God said to Abram, lech lecha. Go for yourself. The expression lech lecha also appears in the account of the binding of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. God begins that test by saying, Please take your son. It is not an order, but an opportunity with a choice. Will Abraham rise to the occasion and through this test gain higher spiritual heights? Likewise, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is not commanded to leave his roots, but is given a choice to continue his outreach work beyond the comforts of home. But this will require shedding all influences of his birthplace and eradicating the pagan influences of his own home. God's challenge to Abraham is his challenge to every one of us. It is not just about going physically from one place to another, but about making a spiritual movement within oneself. Without a destination, Abraham does not take a leap of faith, but a leap of action to do something without understanding why. In Judaism, we believe that our forefathers' experiences are a foreshadowing of our own. This leap of action into the unknown influenced Israel's national consciousness at the Sinaitic revelation to declare, we will do and we will understand in Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. May we be inspired by Abraham's leap of action 
and tap into the incredible growth he experienced as well as the blessings he received. Lech lecha, go for yourself. Abraham had a choice. We have a choice. Are we going to step out? Take this journey of growth. The title of that article, by the way, is Faith Begins Outside Our Comfort Zone. Faith begins outside our comfort zone. Right? Faith without works is dead, is it not? That's what we're talking about. It's not something you only confess. It's something you must take action in. You must step forward. And speaking of comfort zones, my two-year-old son, Levi, got out of his comfort zone yesterday. Literally. I was here studying, preparing for the message, and Sarah texted me, and the text said, Levi just climbed out of his crib. So as parents, you always remember that first time. Uh, it's also, uh, it could be a scary time because sometimes they hurt themselves getting out. And we're kind of shocked that he waited this long to, to do it. But he did it. And he wasn't hurt, but nonetheless, Sarah heard a noise, ran to the room. She had put him down for a nap, and next thing you know, he's out of the crib. And when he saw her, he tried to get back in. <laughs> And I thought about that. Consider the lesson here. Yes, we're born eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We miss the mark. But yet we still have God's breath in us. Life-giving power. And Adam knew what it meant to have a relationship with God that was unadulterated. Everything that Adam and Eve knew before they ate of that tree was only God. Is this good for God? Is this bad for God? I live for God. I commune with God. I walk with God. I do God's work on the earth. He knew what that was like. So how bitter was it then after they were kicked out of the garden? When that type of communication, that type of communion and relationship was severed. So I believe it's innate in all of our DNAs that even as little children, they exemplify that. The fact that we're trying to get to God. We're trying to get to a higher place. We're trying to return to the garden. And for a little child two years old, he doesn't understand that. He, he doesn't understand that. He just acts. He just does it. But as adults, we get, we get encaged in unbelief, don't we? Life's experiences have encaged us, imprisoned us. Help our unbelief, oh God. Help our unbelief. But a two-year-old child, I can do this. And he respects his mother's authority. And he thought, oh, did I make a mistake? Maybe I get back in. I could, get, I could do that too. If I got out, I can get back in. Well, some of us are like that too. We get out of our comfort zone and it gets tough and then we want to get back in to the comfort zone not realizing that the Lord allows tests in our lives just like he tested Abraham not to tear him down but to build him up the Lord knew the potential that Abraham had and he's calling it forth and he will do the same in you he knows the potential because He put it in you. And He wants to call it forth from your life. Because as it does, it glorifies Him. It was the tendency that the sons of Israel had in the wilderness after they were delivered from Egypt. When things got tough, their mind man, it went immediately back to Goshen. Oh, the food we ate there. Oh, life was so simple. Really? Really? That's a tendency. We must surrender to the Lord. How about Peter in the boat and the disciples rowing all night and the wind was contrary to the boat and the waves were contrary to the boat. 
and they're rowing and they're rowing, you know, something that shouldn't take maybe an hour or two, and it's all night. Can you imagine how frustrated they might have must have been? Man, Jesus wants us to go to the other side, and we can't get there. And all of a sudden, they see what they thought was a ghost. And Jesus is coming up. Hey, guys. He's going to pass them by. Here they are rowing, getting nowhere. And Jesus is going to pass them by. But all of a sudden, in Peter, he's quickened. If you call to me, I'll come to you. He sees Jesus. And as hard as it is to, to be rowing in the boat, as terrifying as it might have been with the waves, he sees Jesus. And he says, I want to be where you are, even though it's right there on the water, walking on water. And Jesus says, come. Peter gets out and he starts to do it, doesn't he? But our tendency is fear. Our tendency is to want to go back in the boat. And so he begins to sink but the Lord gets him right puts him back in the boat the lesson for us the Lord wants us out of our comfort zone without that we will not grow we will not mature we will have the same struggles you've heard it said do your best and leave the results up to God but I say to you, God has done his best. Now the results are up to you. Who said that? Well, there was a famous Jewish rabbi who once talked in that style. But he didn't say that. I said that. You have heard it said, do your best and leave the results up to God. And I like that. There's some truth there. But I say to you today, God has done his best. Now the results are up to you. God's best was to provide for himself the lamb. His only begotten son. Jesus' blood as a covering for our transgressions. That was God's best. And he didn't leave Jesus in the grave, but he raised him up so that we could give our best back to him. It's not about just where you go when you die. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. If you walk with God, if you journey with God, if you're in this adventure with God, there's no fear about the destination. The living, resurrected Jesus is a picture of that scapegoat removing your tendencies towards sin, giving you hope for your future, that your tomorrow can be better than today because you are trusting Him to deliver you, to save you from the schemes of the devil, from the fleshly handles of our lives that the enemy grabs a hold of and shakes us with. For you have been crucified with Messiah, and it is no longer you who live, but Messiah lives in you. And the life which you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and delivered Himself up for you. That is the good news. So repent. Repent. Do your part. Return to God. Move forward. Have the faith of Abraham. Get out of your comfort zone. Grow spiritually. Be holy. This is what Yom Kippur demands of us. To reflect on this last year. And to look forward to the year to come. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.